So I know what you're thinking. Only an idiot would stack drives on a table like this when they move their arms around as much as I do. But you know what? I like a challenge. So let's do today's video about Seagate hard drives. And I'm going to leave these drives on here on this table in the hope I don't knock them over. I'll see you at the end of the video. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Hello and welcome back and today we want to do another before you buy and today we want to talk about Seagate hard drives. Now of course we're predominantly going to be talking about network attached storage today but there will be the odd token mention of other brands out there such as the Barracuda series because Seagate hard drives as a whole have Things have really changed in the hardware market over the last few years. And once again, although we are looking at NAS, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the changes in buying patterns and the appeal of certain brands appeals to a broader spectrum of just hard drives there. And in today's video, we're going to talk about that particular change in the market and how Seagate has suddenly become a great deal more desirable to drive brands in the last few years. We're also going to talk about how the brand has rejigged its uh, available drives and how they kind of moved the menu so to speak in their portfolio and then we're going to talk about why you should buy a Seagate drive and in some cases why you shouldn't. So first things first Seagate hard drives. Seagate are one of the brands that have been around for quite a long time. Who are they? They were one of the um, earliest brands in the world of network uh, of um, hard drives it has to be said. Again when it comes down to hard drives, although there are lots of middling brands in between, I do think the likes of Western Digital, um, Seagate, Toshiba, these are the brands, the big, big, big ones that have been around for decade upon decade. They're the ones that almost certainly your first device you ever owned, particularly PCs, but laptops and home consumer devices as well that had a little hard drive in there, like a little TiVo box or something. All of these devices probably had a hard drive inside that was either a WD at Toshiba or a Seagate. And in more recent years, and by recent I mean at least the last decade, hard drives have changed to a point where much like the cutlery in the drawers of your house, they have been retooled and rejigged towards different directions. Now, on this table right now, we have four kinds of hard drive. This isn't their full spectrum. There's a few that aren't here on the table, such as the Skyhawk Surveillance, but we have a Barracuda drive here that is predominantly designed for utilization in a single use environment in the likes of desktop PCs or single drive archiving or external drives. Then we have the Exos, which is a data center class drive to be utilized in much, much larger RAID arrays and huge rack mount enclosures uh, in excess of eight or 12 uh, bays. Then on this side of the table, we have Seagate Ironwolf and Ironwolf Pro. These are their NAS optimized drives with the non-pro being designed for about eight to uh, five to eight bays of storage and the pro series arriving for larger configurations than that how does seagate justify having different hard drives for different utilizations and not make you think oh it's a bit of a con in it one when they're all the damn same they're all hard drives get out well Nice and simple. Hard drives, much like, again, the spoons and knives in your drawer, are tailored towards different utilizations. And because of the research and development that's gone into hard drives and the different ways in which these devices are used, with some devices being on for days, weeks, months, or years at a time, other ones being higher read to overwrite, and some being higher write over read, the idea is to get the most optimized and best possible experience, different drives have been geared towards different ways. So going back through the lineup, we have first the Barracuda there. The Barracuda has a nice fast spin up, spin down. It also doesn't really uh, hinge on the idea of having to work with multiple other drives. Consequently, it is a far single use environment. It doesn't need to be as open-ended to be, um, basically the instructions and data that is given to it the beginning and the end is all on the one disk. It's not spread across multiple disks and therefore doesn't have to depend on being on for greater lengths of time. The Exos, on the other hand, is designed to be in larger RAID environments, that open-ended data that I just mentioned. Also on top of that, these are the sort of drives that are going to be on for months or years at a time and need to have not only a decent enough build to take a punch and the heavy write actions and read, I dare say, um, in that larger RAID array, but with the increased temperatures that are generated, with the increased vibration, and also the ability to have whatever the reported maximum speed to maintain that speed for years and years and years on end. So next we move into the NAS. You might be thinking, wait, 
that's that there sounded a lot like NAS there. Surely these are the same damn thing in a different colour. They're really not. Iron Wolf drives, on the other hand, are the ones designed for NAS systems which scale toward. So these are the systems, large scale rack mounts, again we're talking 16 bays and bigger Xeons and crazy 10, 25G and even 100G scenarios. These are designed for everything between zero and that, uh, that large scale we just mentioned. So whether you're looking at the non-pro or pro, you are still looking at systems that are designed for smaller back chins of drives, uh, again, ranging um, up to about 16 or 24 bay in some cases. These are designed, again, for that balance read-write action there, but the difference is these aren't designed to hit that peak performance consistently. And when these drives are read and written to over a greater length of time, you will find that the Exos will maintain that higher read-write for longer over time. There's other reasons uh, that the Exos has been moved aside into its own separate subcategory to do with interfaces. And at the end of the video, I'm going to talk to you about when you should switch from Pro to Exos or when you are on standard NAS hard drives, which one you should be erring towards. So stay tuned for that at the end of the video. But then, of course, you've got Skyhawk, their surveillance drive. And you might be thinking, wait, these NASs next to you, they do surveillance. Surely you just use NAS drives, the same damn thing. Surveillance is different. Surveillance involves having heavy write action and occasional read. And by that I mean you've got one or more multiple cameras. And there you go, spread my arms around, no drives knocked over. You have multiple cameras all dotted around your home or business environment, constantly sending feeds of footage onto the NASs. And then occasionally when you get an alert, when you want to check if the postman came, when you want to just check the cameras, that's when you're going to read that data. And at the same time, data still being written to those drives. Those are drives that are designed like 90, 95% write, 5, 10% read. Something that none of these drives here are geared towards. And that's really how Seagate uh, refined their range into these different discs. So is that the main reason that Seagate suddenly jumped ahead of pretty much everyone right now in terms of hard drives? No, there's a few other things that have to be bared in mind. One of them, I'm sure you're screaming at the camera right now, and I know, a bit rude, of course, Shingled Magnetic Recording, SMI, was a hell of a faux pas by um, uh, WD a couple of years ago there. Uh, when it first started appearing, the idea was that WD read hard drives, some of the capacities were using drive-managed Shingled Magnetic Recording. That is when data is being written to the disks. Uh, traditional drives are PMR and CMR, and PMR, Perpendicular Magnetic Recording, and CMR, conventional magnetic recording, is when data is being written onto the platters inside the disk. One second. When data is being written, I should have had that ready. When data is being written inside that little circle there, that little platter there, I'm trying to make sure the light doesn't go nuts. Data is written there in circles in even threads all the way through. And then that little arm goes across and reads it. Now, these SMR drives that um, WD Red released... These smaller capacities, I think it was between 2 and 6 TB, these drives use shingle. And that is when, instead of all of these tracks on that disc being completely next to each other, you know, no interference, these are slightly overlapped during the, read, uh, the writing operations. And then, during moments of standby on the disc, the system then takes the time to then put them back into their own tracks. It allows an apparent larger capacity and also makes your performance is pretty good on those discs with a larger amount of cache there. What's the big problem? Once you're doing heavy operations on these disks, and that's just day-to-day -day operations, or a RAID rebuild, or RAID resync, RAID, you know, that sort of stuff, these drives didn't have enough time to go into standby, and therefore, if a disk failed, you could be in a situation where multiple disks would fail within the array, and they'd all fall over. Now, WD didn't invent shingle magnetic recording. They didn't, and they are a good brand. Where did they drop the ball? They dropped the ball by not telling anyone that was the problem a lot of people weren't so much angry that wd utilized smr drives because they're not alone seagate have got smr drives their archive drives for example are smr and toshiba has smr drives other brands have smr drives it's not a problem the problem was having smr drives as nas drives and not being very loud about it, not telling people. And lots of people, by reverse engineering of checking the disks, 
went to WD and went, uh, excuse me, you are using SMR drives, and they weren't getting a clear answer until eventually it all spun out of control, and it was a real PR disaster. Now, why am I telling you this whole story? Because all the way through that, Seagate just kept its head down. They weren't using SMR drives in their NAS series, and the ones that did have SMR, they some of their drives were even called an SMR drive. Uh, the archives, for example, the early 8TBs. And the result was that Seagate, just by carrying on and keeping their head down, suddenly got very, very popular because WD and the PR machine kind of hit a wall a little bit there. They are recovering massively from that. They've introduced the WD Red Plus series. They've rejigged their entire range. They've tried to be a lot more transparent. They've renamed or uh, reclassified and displayed a lot of that information on their drives. But unfortunately, the PR damage there is still going to take a while before it gets reversed upon. The other thing that Seagate did to suddenly leap back into people's attention a great deal more is creative pricing and creative add-ons. The add-ons, one of which, of course, I'm going to talk about later on. But the creative pricing has led to Seagate drives, terabyte for terabyte, always being more affordable than any other brand. And I include Toshiba in that as well, who have generally been quite um, aggressive on their pricing. Seagate, be it in NAS or non-NAS drives, they are a better price per terabyte overall. Yes, with a lot of their drives, they get to the market first, which is always useful. Generally, they've arrived with, um, in the last few generations, from 12, 14, 16, 18, and even 20 TB, arriving on the market before anyone else with that capacity. But even then, they've still managed to have a price point less than that of Western Digital slash WD in their respective ranges of um, uh, Skyhawk, uh, sorry, um, um, Iron Wolf versus Red or Exos versus uh, 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 Western Digital Ultra Star. Now, those two things, the SMR-related um, short um, PR disaster for WD and that creative pricing from um, Seagate led to Seagate taking a lot more market share than they've ever had before, not just in NAS. But now Seagate has kind of achieved an area of um, stability and e achieved an area of notoriety more so than ever before, what are they doing with it? What have they done with their range? What about that rejigging that I mentioned at the beginning? Well, Seagate drives for a long time. Practically every capacity were, uh, from 1 all the way through to 16 TB, you could get a 1 TB in standard drive and a 1 TB in pro drive. And it went all the way through uh, 10, 12, 14, 16 TB. The pro and the regular drive, be it in NAS or otherwise, were available. They were different prices with between 30 and 50 pounds price difference between them, but they were at least there. Now, in the last nine to 12 months, Seagate have rejigged their entire portfolio. Consequently, you've ended up with um, at the moment, the standard class of drives arriving at between 1 and 12 TB only. Now, these are three-year warranty drives. They are supporting of uh, NAS configurations of up to about eight bays. They have an RPM of between 5,400 to 7,200 in the larger capacities and provide a performance of around 180 to 210 megabytes per second all the way through, which is still pretty good. But what about those larger capacities? Why aren't they readily available? Why are there none of the larger capacities on the standard class drives? If we look at the Pro Series, we see them arriving starting at 4 TB, odd number, and going all the way up to 18 TB there. Now, these drives arrive with five years warranty. They arrive with support up to 24 bay environments. Again, after that is when you hop onto your Exos. And then after that, they have um, a workload of 300 TB terabytes written. And that's an annual workload. That is 120 terabytes higher than the 180 terabytes written per year on the standard class. With that, they are all 7,200. They've all got more cash overall. And they have a, a performance max of between 220 to 260 megabytes per second. Why is there now very little crossover when before you had pro and non-pro overlapped completely? Why this? Nice and simple. It's because the large capacities, they need more cash. They need this rugged design all the way around. They need to basically be the best drive anyway. And it's ultimately impossible to make a non-pro version of that drive. So 
they were looking at their portfolio and seeing that the difference between them, if you looked at the price, it was the same. Once you went to the larger capacities, the difference between pro and non-pro was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And some brands have kind of clipped the wings of some drives, which is incredibly unpopular. Or you could just go, right, these ones in the middle between 4TB and 12TB, you can get those in regular and pro. But if you're going bigger than 12, you've got to go pro. If you're going less than 4 you can have regular because there's nothing a pro drive is really going to give you overall in the grand scheme of things. So that's why they rejig the portfolio. Do you, do you like that? Do you not like it? Do let me know in the comments because I think this is another area of contention where there's arguments on both sides. Now, I mentioned services and add-ons earlier and one of the reasons why they became very, very popular, um, Seagate, or almost meteorically in a very short space of time. Um, they were always popular, but not the way they are now. That is two things. It is to do with one, um, Seagate's iWolf Health Management System. It's an on-disk drive health check that if you have a relevant NAS system, it can access. And it's like another extra few disk check layers next to your smart tests and stuff. And, you know, it's a negligible result, I think, for a lot of people who actually use it. I think it does the job, but you've got to actively and proactively schedule it and look at the results. But the other thing that's really, really appealing is data recovery services, the Seagate Rescue Service, which is included in pretty much all of their drives now, with a few exceptions in the portfolio. That means, um, I think it's three years, data recovery services included with the disk. Now, a number of us use these drives in NAS systems, in PCs and more. And we have them in RAIDs. We like having that safety net there in case we lose a drive there. We might have a few backups in place. But these do not protect you from things like data deletion or physical corrupted damage, natural disaster, stuff like that. And all of these drives now arrive with the rescue data recovery services included. And of course, I've talked about it before, we really messed up some Seagate drives on purpose, hammers and stairs and water and stuff to show that the recovery service could recover data. Something that would have cost tens of thousands of pounds to do privately and they're including it with their drives. That's a big, big extra. It's not the quickest, and the level of service and recovery, you know, I would uh, recommend go to the TNCs because some of it's deletion, some of it's rollback, and if you can um, show that the destruction of that data is beyond your own fault and within reasonable accepted measures, they'll provide that service. But still, nonetheless, that is great to have inclusive data recovery services. And again, that rescue service is available on third party uh, on platforms like Amazon and the such and the like as a paid extra per year. They are rolling that into the drives, and I think that's another key reason um, uh, that I think a lot of people have bought Seagate drives, and certainly a reason why you may want to consider buying them for yourself. So. Let's end it on that final point I talked about before. A number of you who may already have Seagate IronWolf hard drives inside your NAS system. Maybe you've already got a RAID array on your Synology or QNAP NAS, and you're thinking of upgrading your system, upgrading your drives, you know, one way or another, and you're thinking you want to go for something a bit beefier. You're, you're moving away from IronWolf drives, and certainly you're not going to go for any Barracuda or stuff like that. And you're coming down to that point where you're looking at Exos drives and looking at IronWolf Pro drives and you don't know which way to go. Ultimately, you know why you might go Pro. I've already gone through it. The enhanced uh, terabytes annual workload of 300, 7200 RPM. It's a natural progressive step up from standard. But why would you want to skip, uh, skip Pro and go straight into Exos? What does Exos bring to the party really that Pro doesn't? Number one, it has a much better consistent and higher read-write overall. These data center class drives have a higher read-write on across their entire capacity than Pro. But again, they maintain that higher number for longer and consistently when in active read-write action singularly or in larger RAID arrays, of course. Next, Exos drives also arrive with optional on-drive encryption. So you can choose whether you want to use uh, military-grade encryption on these disks internally. You do have to pay extra because the Exos series is a bit more diverse in its part numbers, but you can choose multiple um, security maps like FIPS and stuff like that to protect your archive data inside, even within the RAID array. With the NAS, unlocking the encryption and locking the encryption at power down. On top of that, Exos is available 
in SAS as well as SATA architecture. Indeed, there's even that Mac 2, 2 actuator system we'll talk about in another video very soon. But Exos drives allow you to open up SAS connectivity, which again, it's just incredible compared with our size. Double that at 12 gigabit with SATA being standard six gigabit and the performance thresholds getting better and better and better, better on these drives, meaning that you can have a SAS arranged storage system and take advantage of much, much faster drives or at least drives that have a higher capacity that may have been ever so slightly bottlenecked by a traditional SATA. They're better for larger arrays. You've got that consistent read write. But a, one of the main reasons, weirdly, at the end of this year, that people seem to opt for an Exos drive over a Pro is because they're cheaper. What? It's true. Exos drives are actually lower in price, terabyte for terabyte, than Pro Series drives, even though these don't have data recovery services at the time of recording. Maybe that changes in the future. These drives have... You know, the pros are really, really good drives. Are they worth the extra bit of money? If you'd like to afford it, then certainly. Data center class drives are noisier, certainly. Wow, they're noisier. Check out my sound tests from a previous video because they're designed for huge RAID arrangements that you're never going to be in close proximity with. They have more cache inside and they consume a bit more power. But other than that, they're still, in my opinion, practically a better drive than the pro in every single way. And with everything going on with chia and shortages at the moment, we're definitely seeing that the UltraStars, the Exos, your data center class drives are getting rarer and rarer because people are bulk buying drives for crypto. And the pros, because of that price point and the margins um, uh, within those cryptocurrencies being quite, quite thin on a return of investment ROI, that pros and their higher price tag means that they're actually more available right now. Obviously, that will change whenever you watch this video. But still, nonetheless, it still boggles my brain that Exos and data center class drives are lower in price than pros. Again, that level of flexibility when it comes to the interface connection, encryption on the drive, and just general build quality and robust constant read-write mean that an Exos drive will often be a very suitable upgrade for the more enterprising user jumping from prosumer systems. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know I have, and I love talking about hard drives. I've not knocked these drives over yet, and the temptation to do it right now at the end of the video is unbearable, but I'm not going to. If you enjoyed the video, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. And of course, if you are looking for the right data storage solution for your home or business needs and need a bit of a helping hand, and you don't want to pay for it, Go to the free advice section at NASCompares. It's manned by myself and Eddie the Web Guy. It is completely free. There's a donation button if you want to do that. That would be lovely. We might use affiliate links with some of the retailers, but we will tell you in advance. And ultimately, it is a free service to help you get the right data storage solution you need. It might take a second day or so to get in contact with you because there's only two people, two human beings with lives. But we will respond to every email. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.